Hello everyone, welcome to the leadership in DPN both or we call it panel. So I'm very excited about the session today. We have um, all the excellent uh, speaker here with us uh, right now. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker, Jonathan Carter. Uh, he is your current TBN project leader. Um, I believe that most of you already know uh, Jonathan. He um, based out of South Africa. He has been a Linux user since 1999 and TBN developer since 2017. Of course, he also a member of many teams inside DBN and uh, he was part of the DEFCOM committee from 2017 to 2019. Jonathan, would you like to um, talk briefly about the purpose and the ideas of this um, leadership panel? Yes, so welcome to the leadership in Debian session. Uh, we've had some DPL panels in the past, but as, oops, my note is cut off. That's very nice. <laughs> One second. So what did I say? Um, we can but as hear far you. as I know, <laughs> yeah, um, we've had some DPLs panels in the past, but as far as I know, this is the first time we're having a discussion specifically on this topic of leadership. So feel free to add questions to the Etherpad at any time, and we'll try to get all questions answered. So um, there are many ways in which one can be a leader. I remember back when I was in grade three, our teacher told uh, our class how important it was to always set a good example. Uh, because if we do something like throw a piece of litter on the ground instead of in the bin, uh, someone in, who's in grade one will see that in, and end up emulating that kind of behavior. So I guess you could say that's a form of leading by example. Now, in Debian, we have many kinds of leadership roles, and in many ways, every Debian developer is a type of leader already. I also think that leadership and trust go hand in hand. When a leader loses their trust in the community, they also lose the support of that community. So as an organization, we are vendor neutral and exist to serve the best interests of our users. And while it's sometimes difficult to figure out exactly what the right choices are for our users, we do try our best. And with that, we've gained a lot of trust of a of, we've gained the trust of a large community of users out there. And in many ways, the Debian project itself plays a leadership role within the software world. So when I became DPL, it was my intention to buy a good book or two on the topic of leadership. Unfortunately, I've been a bit too busy and I haven't gotten around to that yet. But um, I've been enjoying an account on Twitter that's called Picard Management Tips that I'll share in the, the links. It's quite funny. Um, um, but with that, uh, I'm, I'm not going to linger too much on the topic. I think I've explained it a bit. Um, I'm going to let Hong continue to introduce the rest of the speakers in this session as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, you can uh, go into the Etherpad. You can find on the schedule to start to uh, write out question to the speakers. So I would have uh, the honor to continue to introduce other DBN leaders. Uh, Vido, good to see you again here. So uh, Vido, uh, who first contribution to what we now call free software back in 1979. He joined the DPN project in 1994 before the first stable release and had been involved ever since. He maintains a number of packages and in the past of the DPL, the chair of technical committee, and even briefly as a project secretary. He's now retired from the corporate world, but co-owns and operates a successful open hardware business together with Keith Packer. Bidel also served on the boards of several nonprofit organizations, including Software Freedom Conservancy, Freedom Box Foundation, and the Amateur Radio Digital Communications. Welcome, Bidel. Uh, okay, so next, uh, I have my lovely friend Elena here as well. So Elena has been using DBN for ne nearly 15 years and become a DBN developer in 2017. She currently leads closer packaging team, which she uh, revived in 2017 and serves as a member of the technical committee. Outside of DBN, she is a Python Software Foundation Fellow, Chair of the Communities Instrument Special Interest Group, and a Director of the Open Source Initiative, where she serves as uh, a Chair of um, the 
um, uh, affiliate committee and also serve on um, the license committee. Elena currently works for Red Hat as a principal site a reliability engineer and tech lead on the Archa Red Hat OpenStrip team. Welcome, Elena. Uh, Maga. Maga has been a Debian developer for almost 15 years and has been serving in the technical committee since 2016. Where are you based now, Maga? She I'm currently in Germany. I'm originally from Argentina. Ah, okay, cool. I'm also in Germany. <laughs> uh, she's been working in Linux industry since 2003, including eight years working at Google. She was involved in the organization of DEF CON for a while. Uh, in particular, she was part of the main org team for DEF CON 8 in Argentina and DEF CON 15 in Germany, as well as have out at different tasks in other editions. Bruce. Yeah, so our famous Bruce is also here now. So Bruce's parents were the second DPL. He was the first to contribute to this um, to contribute to the base system, um, uh, and uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, there's a changes. Yeah, so let me uh, by contributing development this way and for other innovation while he was the DPL. He is said to be the creator of the modern Linux distribution. He also re, um, created BCBox for the Debian installer. Um, he was the principal author of the Debian social contract and the Debian free software guidelines, which become like, uh, a reference for many other projects these days on the, um, on the open source community. Later, um, of course, this become the open source definition. He was one of the founders uh, of the software in the public interest. Yeah, and uh, he gave a very inspiring talk on uh, a few days ago at the at the conference. Welcome, Bruce, again. Thanks very much. Uh, next, I have uh, Enrico. Enrico is a Debian developer and currently Debian account manager who handle all your financial features. <laughs> he also, uh, I guess, is it or not? So he looks after new maintainer site, um, nm.dbn.org, contributors.dbn.org, devtax.dbn.org, and sso.dbn.org. Yeah, maintaining uh, many other services. Welcome, um, Ireko. And Hello. we have finally, last but not least, we have Steve. Steve has been around DBN since 1996, working on a lot of different things over the years. <laughs> he was DBL for two terms. He's currently a member of a lot of teams. Um, the I installer uh, M images, community team, and more. He was also even silly enough to help run DevCon back in the dim and distant past. Yeah. Okay, so I have um, all the speakers here now. Um, Jonathan, uh, let me check if we have any questions. So uh, already, um, do you want to uh, kick off with a topic? Yeah. Let my let me see, is there any any topic anyone would start with or shall we uh, jump into questions already? I'll, I'll start with one. Great. Okay, so I think that one of the most important ways in which leadership has been shown in Debian is that Debian has been the source of great ideas, which everyone in Linux distributions in the open source community uses. And I wanted to go into the unpronounceable sentence in my bio, um, because it's actually an example. Um, one of the things that I did as the second Debian project leader was that Ian Murdoch was personally maintaining the entire base system. That means all of the very important packages in Debian that it took for the system to boot and install other packages. Ian maintained those solely by himself. 
And when I came in as project leader, I took those packages and distributed them all to other developers. Now, today, that sounds really simple. But back then, no one had actually ever tried distributing all of the core components of an operating system to people that had not even met each other. At that time, I had not met another Debian developer. Um, and uh, it worked. <laughs> and of course, this is what all of the community developed. Uh, Linux distributions do today. Similarly, Debian exercised leadership in the Debian Free Software Guidelines, which became the open source definition in many technical decisions. And I'm just talking about the ones I worked on. Obviously, there have been many, many others. So I think that that is actually the most important part of leadership in Debian is that Debian provides leadership. Yeah, even if you look at apt and other tool, other package managers that came after it, it kind of it kind of emulates the same way that apt works. So if you do a pip install or remove or any of the package managers from other tools, it, it's kind of copied uh, some of the good ideas that we have in Debian. So uh, yeah, definitely an example of uh, leadership from Debian right there. Yeah, so talking about Debian leadership, there is a question directly to the Debian leadership on the topic, um, uh, like racism uh, as a global issue. So how uh, do we as leader in the uh, project respond to these issues? Oh, Hong, that's my question. So do you want me to ask that one? Yes, so I think it's related. Since we talk about the, the leadership, uh, how to respond to certain uh, global issue, I think we can answer this question as a group. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll I'll write or I'll read what I wrote in the Etherpad. Um, I'm finding it sort of difficult this week to focus on the conference, to focus on technical issues like Bruce has discussed, uh, because uh, while I'm Canadian, I'm based in the U.S. And the injustice of pr police brutality, particularly against Black Americans, is first and foremost on my mind right now. So while Debian's not an American project, racism is a global issue that affects all of our community and our contributors' well-being. So how do we as leaders in the project respond to these issues? I feel like we've been floundering. We, we have been floundering. I mentioned that in my DPL talk as well. Um, we, we've, we've failed to address or make a statement for, for, for Black Lives Matter that I think it's still not too late to do. Um, but tonight, I also watched the news for the first time in the last week and uh, saw the latest police brutality incident. And uh, I actually thought, you know, it's been nice having this break and escape from the news and all the bad news in the world for the last week when I've had my head so deep in, in, in DebConf. But it also hits home again. I took a break the last week from all of that, but for most people in the world, they don't have a choice. If you're a woman or if you're black or if you're transsexual, you don't get to take a break or go on a little holiday from that. Um, it, it just hit that home again, and I wanted to comment on that. But, so I don't have any solutions yet. Maybe we can discuss that further, but um, it is tough. Um, all, it just doesn't stop all the bad news that happens out there, and especially when it concerns um, black people, and especially in the US. But I, on that, I, I could ramble on this probably for the next hour. So sorry, I won't go on too long. But we have that even in South Africa, the, the institutional police problems, where, um, you know, it, it's still black people being targeted, even though the police is black, but it's so institutionalized in the police system that that still continues, even though it's not white policemen um, anymore. Um, but I, th I think we do need to to try to prevent institutional problems, institutional racism too, but all kinds of institutional problems within Debian, because we actually don't often, we don't talk about it at all ever. And I think we do need to do that a bit more. I'll take that if you wish. Sure. So I think we have to make sure our own house is clean first. And that means that Debian needs to have policies and processes that prevent racial discrimination within its own organization. And I think for the most part that we've done that, we have to make sure that they actually work. So
Second to that, yes, we can make statements. If you look on my own website, parents.com, you'll notice there's a statement on solidarity with Black Lives Matter, which goes through my own um, incident as being on the receiving side of prejudice since I, I grew up as a reasonably severely handicapped young person, grew out of it uh, eventually. And um, so the, the question becomes, can Debian take an active role against uh, injustice and racial prejudice. And one of the suggestions has been ethical licensing, where you have a license that says, uh, this can't be used for racial injustice. Um, and those have been around for a very long time. When I started work on the Debian free software guidelines, there was already the SPICE license that said this software may not be used by the police of South Africa. At that time, South Africa had ended apartheid and the license still stood. So it was potentially a problem rather than a solution. Um, forward to today, uh, ethical licenses are again a concern. And my problem with them is I don't believe that you can in, uh, enforce social justice in a copyright court. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Bruce. I think we have to be really careful. I think it's totally appropriate for all of us as participants in the Debian project to care about these issues and to try, as Jonathan started off um, saying that, you know, we should try to lead by example. And as Bruce indicated, you know, let's make really sure that the Debian project internally isn't, you know, propagating any particularly bad behaviors in this area. But I think it's I think it's equally important that we sort of remember that the reason that we come together in Debian is to collaborate on creating something which actually has immense social value, um, and that is an operating system composed entirely of free software. And in doing so, we are actually, you know, doing lots of things that are socially useful, making technology available, you know, addressing digital divide issues in various places around the world. And I don't know that we necessarily have to, you know, <clears throat> take on every problem that the world has as, as, a, as a first order uh, concern of the project as a whole. Jonathan, I would totally support uh, you're putting out some supporting messages uh, in the name of the project. And I would certainly hope that, you know, these are issues that all of us individually care about. I think what I'm just trying to express is that we need to be careful not to to get so augured in on this that we're unable to continue to you know, be able to productively collaborate on that thing which brought us together in the first place. Yeah, and one of the reasons that I raised this question was specifically because I find the project's lack of response to this issue uh, making it difficult for me to collaborate. Like, how can I care about technology when like people are dying in the streets? It, it's very difficult uh, and, uh, you know, police brutality is certainly not just uh, a, an issue in the United States, it's an issue globally. So while Debian is a global project, uh, you know, I think that we are maybe in a unique position to consider how free software can interact with some of these issues and serve as a liberating force. Yeah, so there is actually a very similar uh, question. Uh, maybe other speaker can jump in, uh, asking about if Debian is doing something of lands, uh, some uh, thing uh, to bring in more ethics into the conversation around technology and computing. Uh, Steve, Marga, Enrico, do you want to answer to that? Is there something that we're doing currently or plan to do? So, of course, Debian has always been talking about the ethics of free software and making sure that everybody can do can get involved, everybody can contribute, everybody is free to use, to develop, to learn from that free software. That is priority one. It always has been for us. Um, there is a lot this is a huge topic as you know I'm, as people have already been saying um not everybody in debian where you know in the community necessarily agrees about all of the politics 
of of everything we do but i think that's what the one place that we actually do have or we should expect 100 percent overlap um we want to be empowering people with the great free software that we're distributing that we're developing that we're helping to maintain and making it possible for everybody out there regardless of race creed or color to get involved um we historically have not been a great place for people of color or people of minorities such as women that's just that's that's a more of a historical accident than than anything else the best thing we can absolutely do for me is help people to get involved help people to to benefit from what we do whether that helps them to pull themselves into a better place you know to catch up on some of the privilege that hey i i and others here have benefited from that's a great start as to taking on police brutality and all that wonderful if we can do that too it can't be our first priority but it's obviously it's something that worries lots of us getting women involved in debian and this is going back to when there were 60 people on the Debian project, um, has always been very difficult. And something as project leader that at that time, I certainly wasn't able to get a handle on. And it was indeed very frustrating. And it exists the same way today in ham radio. Women are very much monopoly. and. Sometimes I feel I, I know all of the women in ham radio. And um, it, it's um, something that I would love other people to give us better solutions for. Yeah, I mean, Bruce, like VE6JIT, I come from that world too. It's alienating uh, constantly everywhere. And I mean, like, even in this discussion, there are three women on the panel, uh, but like, my my focus of my subject was racism like these are problems that you know i i don't necessarily think that this is a wider diversity question uh and there was a great uh diversity session uh that i watched uh on the opening day of the conference uh i specifically want to focus on uh or at least like the question that i raised to the leadership i mean looking at this panel like we do not have racial diversity it's not something that we're doing a good job on in the project and it's not something that i think people are going to be like oh yes here is a solution on a silver platter please come and like implement it uh i i think that we can do better uh, I'm not necessarily sure how to do better, but uh, I think that one of the ways that we can do better is not necessarily changing the topic when like, we have these hard things raised and to sit and think and try to, try to respond to the direct things that we are being asked to solve and not necessarily redirect to things that are, you know, we're, we're doing a better job at. I was very happy to see that there were talks on uh, speaking and writing one of the 22 scheduled Indian languages in Debian uh, in this conference, uh, a language that I'm sad to admit I'd never heard of. Uh, and that kind of work helps. Yeah, so uh, ethic is a huge topic, right? Is we can go on forever, but let's move on to, to the next question. Um, uh, Enrico, is that okay for you that we uh, continue? With the next question, uh, I thought that you raise your hand if you want to ask something. Yeah, but I don't want to hog the thing. So if you want to move on, something else is fine. Yeah, so maybe you can take the next question that I uh, basically I on the <laughs> So it's about um, uh, like volunteering times uh, for DBN projects. So the question is that DBN volunteers are not employees of DBN context. How can we limit the work and therefore opinion rate at risk with being linear with up pay time availability? So um, yes, I'm not so sure that I would, I understand this question, but perhaps it's about uh, the balance between volunteers uh, for DBN project and the normal uh, job. If I understand, I, so if somebody wants to take it, Maga? I, I, I think 
think I understand the question, yeah. <laughs> maybe. So I think uh, the point here is that uh, the, the famous meritocracy story, like we say Debian is a meritocracy and like it's a good thing. Um, and it's like the one that has the most time is the one that gets to do the most things. And then the person that has the most time available, basically their opinion ends up having more value because uh, they had more time available. I think this is where the question is going. I'm not sure, but this is my understanding of the question. Well, I, I think the person who's the most assertive is the one who gets listened to the most, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Right. So I mentioned the, the meritocracy, like that's a good thing because I, many times the meritocracy thing is used like a, um, a way to hit people into compliance and to like, okay, I have this package, I have done this thing. And so you need to like do what I say, even if it's not necessarily the best option or the thing that benefits the community the most. So I'm very skeptical of meritocracy in general. I think there's like more things to consider when, when they think what's the right decision for the project. B. Dale, come off mute and say that again. Uh, B. Dale, you're muted. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Toggles are such a wonderful user interface thing. Um, look, so <clears throat> um, Margaret, you're absolutely right. There, there are fundamental problems with the concept of meritocracy, but in Debian, I, I don't know how we're ever going to avoid being what I call a duocracy, which is, you know, those who do end up being the ones who do. And um, this, this may in fact just utterly disqualify me from being able to help solve some of these problems because I don't really see any way around that. I think, you know, to some extent, this comes back to some of the very fundamental sort of early decisions that were made about how the project would organize itself and this notion of um, <clears throat> the, the, the way our constitution is structured where individual developers have an immense amount of authority, and we only sort of invoke others in the project when there are situations or problems or, or questions that individual developers can't resolve on their own. And in some sense, this tickles my brain about the difference between leadership and management. Uh, we somehow have a structure that seems to um, to sort of encourage, you know, um, reactive processes more than proactive or visionary or leadership processes. Um, because one of the things that I think about when I think about, you know, applying uh, uh, metrics other than straight meritocracy is, you know, how would we go about making concrete decisions about technical direction in a way other than we do now? And I, I sort of don't know how to do that without you know, creating some other kind of structures within the project. Um, so we we kind of so far defined ourselves as duocracy with the idea that who that who puts in the work uh, gets to decide the direction. Um, what while reflecting on writing notes for mine and Ulrike's talk. Um, uh, there was a graph that has an axis towards uh, building on the relationship, not, not just on one what one wants to think, to, to one wants to do to get. Um, and then, the, so the people who have time and energy could also invest some in building a relationship, a community around their work, and who has extra time could think of empowering others with that time rather than go on their own way. However. It would mean asking people to switch from development to management or, co or coordination, which might not be what people are motivated to do or want to do with their time in Debian. So it's a bit of a tricky uh, thing uh, because we're working on volunteers. It's pretty hard, uh, hard to ask people what to volunteer on. So it may be that we are structurally stuck there, but it would be politically interesting to see if we can divert some of that energy to uh, bring in like more, uh, like use energy to pull in rather than just to move on. Steve? 
So rather than thinking about uh, management and coordination, where I tend to find actually personally, this is entirely a personal thing, I actually get a great deal out of mentorship and training and helping other people get up to speed these days. Um, there are never enough in hours in the day to do the technical things I, I want to be working on um, because, let's be honest, there are always more projects than there are hours in the day. Um, it's a really, really fun thing to help other people get up to speed to, to ideally to go off and do some of those things for me, particularly the boring things I don't want to do. Um, that's my take. Yes, so, and anyone else want to comment on this uh, question? Okay, so we have 14 minutes left. Uh, let's uh, take another question on the top of the list. Um, is DBN uh, or should DBN be more opinionated as a group to push digital wide changes? And a thought experiment to avoid the obvious in phase system discussion, making up our more installed by default. I also uh, uh, based the question on the chat for the speakers who would like to take this uh, question. Bruce, if you are speaking, you're muted. Okay, well, this worked before. Anyway, uh, I think that that's a job for Debian derivative distributions because um, Debian is the universal operating system. That was another leadership thing. And if you want to deliberately make an operating system that isn't universal, you can do things like Debian.edu, et cetera, um, where you can specialize in that way and kind of lead the people by the hand. Uh, the problem with doing that with a universal distribution is that it gets in the way when people do corner cases. For example, when I'm putting Debian on a relatively small system, I don't want a GUI. I don't want anything about a GUI on that kind of system. Well, we have we have two members of the technical committee on this call as well. So I'm I'm wondering if they have any opinions on system on, on distribution wide changes, or if there's ways that people should propose it, or if they could, should involve the CTTE in that. Um, I don't know if you have any opinions, but I'd like to hear from you about that. We have a session tomorrow, uh, and uh, we're going to be discussing some things like that. Marga, maybe you want to talk more about that. Uh, sure. One of the things that is on the table uh, is whether the technical committee should do more design work. And if the answer is no, then how can more design work get done? I feel that actually Debian should do more technical uh, leadership in the world of distributions. Uh, I feel Debian did do this in the past. Like, uh, for example, at the beginning of this talk, uh, we mentioned apt. Apt was a leadership thing. No distribution had a system that resolved dependencies for you. The first one was Debian. And at the time, Debian was constantly innovating and bringing more and more things to the Linux distribution space. And at some point, it just uh, being stable became the one and only thing. And the, the innovation, I'm exaggerating, but the innovation kind of stopped. And I feel that this is something, if we want to keep Debian relevant, we need to change it. I, I don't think the technical committee is the way to change it, but uh, finding a way where uh, Debian can actually innovate and, and bring innovation to the Linux distribution space is one of the we need to do to keep Debian relevant. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, I think that is uh, all the questions we have uh, on the pad. And there are a bunch of comments from the uh, followers, but I don't see... Um, Enrico, um, did you have a comment to make on that one? Yeah. No, I was waiting my agreement. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, I think at this point we can have uh, all of the individual speakers give 
you know, a couple minutes of their own commentary. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So let's just go around the table. Um, I'll, I'll start just to get everyone started. Um, I wasn't a very good Debian project leader, and I found out over time that I don't want to do operations. I don't want to run an organization. Uh, I want to have the ideas and get those in place and then go on with other things. Uh, and so that was actually very frustrating for me, uh, being a DPL and being in that operational role. And it was pretty frustrating in all the other organizations that I participated in. Um, I think that uh, we have to be cognizant that the people who have the ideas are not always uh, really good operational people. Uh, there are leaders, but they're not the people who carry things on day after day. And uh, we need to, as a project, differentiate those kinds of people. Who's next, Moga? Sure. Uh, one of the potential topics that were in the pod uh, was uh, ideas to improve the role of the DPL. And uh, last year, when we at first in the first round, we didn't have any DPL candidates. Uh, we watched very scary for me because I was the chair of the technical committee, so it had implications. Uh, anyway, uh, at that point, there were a few interesting discussions on this topic of like, okay, so why don't we have any candidates? What is going on? Is this something that we should change? And then we got a bunch of candidates and everything just got back on track and we kind of forgot. And I think this is something that we might actually need to think. Uh, I don't know, maybe Jonathan, you can give your take giving the, the chair of the current DPL, but I feel that the amount of tasks that are expected from the DPL, uh, it's very large, um, maybe because different DPLs have done different things uh, throughout the time. And now like there's all this baggage of all the things that are expected from a DPL and that it might be too much for just one person to carry. And instead, it would make more sense for this to be a group of people. And some people could devote their time more to operations, which what Bruce was saying, and other people could devote their time to technical design and others could devote their time to like people leadership, whatever. Uh, but that spreading the load would be better for the project. Uh, I don't know, this is something that I think it's an idea worth exploring. I'm not sure it's the right thing to do, but I would like for us to think more about this and whether it's a thing that makes sense for us. And if so, what do we need to do to make it happen? Cool, I'll, I'll pin that and come back to it when it's my turn. Yeah, so actually there is a question from the IRC. Uh, perhaps we can also take this question. Do you think the age profile in the projects and how it changed over time affect DBN's ability to innovate the communities in aging less young people join over time? I'd actually love to speak to that because I actually have exactly the opposite impression of Debian. Uh, it's interesting when people decide to put together something like this session that you know people like me get invited to come join in, and I'm of course happy to come share a thought or two from from you know past experience. But uh, I've been fascinated. The last couple in-person DebConf that I attended were really full of what I thought of as young, enthusiastic, ambitious people who had much more energy to tackle the kinds of problems we've been talking about in this session than I do. And so I actually have great hope for the future of Debian. I look at, you know, the rest of the folks that are in this particular session and it's not, I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a really good uh, representation of the cross-sectional demographics of the project. Uh, this group is in some ways, I guess, sort of self-selected for people that have been around for a while and, you know, have some history and some experience to perhaps offer. But uh, I, I, my personal impression of Debian is, wow, so many young people with so much enthusiasm and so many great ideas that I wouldn't have even thought of. 
So I think some of this, of course, is you only get to a leadership position by already having some experience to draw on. Um, and some of us here are, I feel quite old sometimes when I see some of the really enthusiastic younger folks and what they're achieving. Um, Debian has been growing older on average. To a certain extent, I think that was always going to be going to be the case just because lots of us who started off 20 something years ago have no intention of going away anytime soon but that doesn't stop us from from encouraging new people to get involved and continuing to um use their ideas and even you know steal some of their enthusiasm you know like use their their great their great ideas use their great passion and keep things going i mean one of my best friends is a 14 year old girl in fact, it's the daughter of a DD. I'm sure a bunch of people here will know exactly who I'm talking about. She'll be a DD. She's already been working on things. It's just a matter of time. Um, today, I ended up um, doing some training in my day job of, um, an, for an, of an intern who, and I was amazed at this, told me how, how fun he thought packaging was. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll steal him next. Yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep on finding the the, the yeah. new people who want to join in. I think Ilona is next. Am I? Uh, am I supposed to talk about being like the you know token young person on the panel, or <laughs> if you have something to say? <laughs> if I have something to say. Uh, I mean, I am the token young person on the panel. I will relate that back maybe to uh, one of the things that uh, that was discussed earlier uh, with respect to the uh, the burden, I'll call it, of uh, being the Debian project leader. Uh, as this session has been ongoing, I have been receiving multiple IRC messages from multiple lovely people saying, e Hashman for DPL. And every single one of them that I have responded with saying, it's a 20 hour a week unpaid job. I have a 40 hour a week day job. I can't do that work. Uh, traditionally, a lot of the folks that we've had uh, in DPL positions that were very successful were either uh, in academia or freelancing and were basically able to self-fund uh, large portions of their time uh, to the project. And so when people are like, you're an excited young person, like you're in a leadership role in Debian, you should do things. Uh, and I, my response to that is like, and how am I going to be compensated for that labor? Like, I got to eat. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can't spend 20 hours a week unpaid on top of my 40 hours a week day job and my 40 hours a week day job might not give me that time to spend, you know, it's exhausting. Uh, the community is wrestling right now with a lot of topics of sustainability, uh, compensating, uh, developers fairly for their labor. I know that that's in Debian, a particular fraught topic going back to like, you know, the, the scandal of uh, dunk tank, but, uh, these are things that I think that we will Will have to wrestle with uh, in the future as a project. I don't think that we can keep brushing this off the table and say like, yeah, 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 let's just keep funding it with like volunteer effort. That will be sustainable and the project will be fine forever. Well said. Thanks. <laughs> Two minutes. Uh, uh, Enrico, you would like to, uh, to say the final words? Um, well, that's uh, a lot to ask, but maybe the DPL should have the final word. Final words, and then Jonathan, of course, also gonna go to say his final words. Everyone can have. Okay, so I may say the things that uh, I wanted to say about uh, ethics um, and, in, and kind of touching racism a bit. Um, so we have two different bits about ethics in Debian. One is about Debian itself, and we have. Uh, uh, to our core points, no discrimination about fields of endeavor. Uh, so there is no ethics requirement about what you can use Debian for. Uh, but that is different from the ethics of our community. Uh, for example, I think that the most important people is that we do not want uh, Debian people keep other people out of Debian as long as they interact constructively with our community. Um, uh, and that has a lot of implications also uh, with regard to racism. And I would like, uh, it, it's blatant that we do not have many people of color in the project. Um, and I would like to know why, and I'm not competent in investigating on that. I think uh, we have money, we could probably put some into 
asking for help, trying to find out if we have some structural issue, for example, that keep people out. Um, one thing about sending out a statement that uh, was disheartening for me was to the herding cat bit about getting a statement out. Uh, I think we lack a lot of project managing to keep discussion focused and uh, keep a goal in sight when there is something which is like uh, time uh, based or uh, because people start with passion and then get distracted or frustrated and drift off and then asynchronous communication you can't even see that a person has drifted off and something some uh, an effort loses steam and then it's gone uh, we do not have a lot of project management in the sense of people keeping track of where an effort is leading. I would like to see some more of that because as, if it's a technical thing, yeah, okay, it doesn't make this release, it will make the next one. If it's about um, getting a statement to completion and publication, then uh, we don't wait for the next release. There will be three other statements to make. I would like um, to have more efforts about keeping things focused because the intentions are there, but um, then... On the topic of keeping things focused, Enrico, we're, we're now two minutes over time. Can I just say what's one thing before we get cut off? Um, so firstly, I'm going to take the Black Lives Matter thing into another session after the DevConf, and then we can make some concrete plans to, to bring this forward. And then the second thing on the role of DPL, um, I want to talk more about that. I'll do it some other time, but the plan is to make the role of a DPL smaller so that it is an easier job and that it doesn't take, it's 20 plus, it's on the other side of 20 hours a week, not not below it. Um, but I think we can make it a simpler job so that the average DD can take it on and it's not a huge burden. And that's all I'm going to say at this point, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, all the speakers and for the participants for all your contribution on the pad. I saw a lot of excellent comments there. So the speaker, please uh, go to the pad and follow up on those comments. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. Bye.